All right, hello everyone. Welcome to today's live stream with Matt Petrick and Angostura Limited. We have a whole crew present from Angostura today. Um, this is gonna be really fun, really interesting. Uh, you're really gonna get to go inside from a technical standpoint production at Angostura. So I'm really excited uh, for these guys to dig into the presentation. Um, I'll let Matt kind of give a more formal introduction to everyone over there from the Angostura team in just a moment. Real quick, before we get started, my name's Will Hookinga from Zavi.co, and just want to point out a few ways that you guys can interact um, with Matt and with the Angostura team throughout the presentation. So to your right, you'll see a chat window. Uh, feel free to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. I already see people from all over the world over there. Very cool. Minnesota, San Francisco, Berlin, Brussels, Sweden. Hello, everyone. Glad you could make it. Um, secondly, if you have a question at any point, you'll see a little button at the bottom of the screen that says, ask a question. So if you press that, you can submit your questions there. Matt and I will be watching for those throughout the presentation. Uh, we will save some time at the end to answer questions. So be sure to stick around. And last but not least, feel free to invite your friends to join us. Uh, there's a share button at the top of the page that makes it easy to do that. Uh, but okay, with all that said, I'm really eager to let you guys get into this. So Matt, I will turn things over to you now. All right, thank you, Will. Uh, this yes. is like our 10th, uh, 10th session like this with 10th uh, Zavi Werspa session. Now, the idea being is that, you know, with COVID and people unable to travel, we wanted to basically bring the distilleries to you. And so uh, we've been working with our Werspa member distilleries uh, from countries like Barbados, Jamaica, Guyana, Trinidad, uh, St. Lucia, Belize, um, basically getting, getting the people who actually make the rum uh, on getting them on camera and having them take you behind the scenes at the distillery. And most of these presentations so far have been, you know, been great presentations and they have, you know, some great, great pictures in them and things like that and great technical detail. This one we're excited because we actually have some fantastic video footage uh, that really, that really sort of takes you behind the scenes and shows you for some perspectives that you don't ordinarily see in a, in a distillery like this. And also uh, we're going to, at the end, just show you a little bit about how Angostura bitters are made. Uh, which is you don't you don't actually see many images of online so uh this is a special treat um i was myself was fortunate enough to go down to angus store this past december when we could travel um but that so i've been around the angus store facilities uh, i recognize at least one or two pictures in the presentation as as images i took while i was down there um, i was also uh, honored to meet uh Ian, who's one of one of our panel here today, to meet Ian, and then also to meet uh, John Georges, who's not on our panel today, but uh, uh, we spent a day driving all over Trinidad, uh, looking at the release all over the West Coast of Trinidad, uh, gawking at old sugar factories and, and where distilleries once were. So uh, it was it was quite a treat for me. Uh, I actually wrote up uh, two two very long articles about it, uh, which I think Will is going to post links to on my on the screen uh, when he has a moment there. But uh, enough of me chatting here. Um, let's introduce the Angostar team. Uh, let's start with Carol. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful to be here. I'm Carol Homer Caesar. I am the master blender of Angostura Limited. I'm also the senior manager responsible for operations. And I am also responsible for quality assurance and blending. And I have been with the company for 25 years. Wow. Great to be here. Great. Wow. Okay. Um, Wendell, do you want to jump in next? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Wendell Kipps. I'm the manager of the Surrey Operations. I'm responsible for the fermentation and distillation departments. I've been at Amnesty for the past 11 years. Thank you. And uh, Chris. Hi, good afternoon, guys. I'm Chris. I am representing the Wales and Aging Department. I've been at Angostura for the past 15 years. So I'm the guy responsible for all the age rooms and supporting the blending department to get the finished products that we produce at Angostura. Yeah. Right. All right. Fantastic. And uh, Mark. 
Hi, good day everyone. My name is Mark Paul. I've been with Angostura for the past 12 years. Um, I work under Wendell Kipsey Plant Manager as Process Operations Manager with keen oversight over the treatment plant, which we have recently christened the Water Resource Recovery and Anaerobic Digester Facility. Wow. Okay, and last but not least, Ian. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, unlike my colleagues, I've been here the shortest. I've only been here for three years. Uh, my background is one of food science and technology. I'm actually a master brewer, and I'm in the process of learning distilling. So I'm the fortunate one to learn from all of these very, very uh, experienced persons here. A pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Yeah, and, and if I understand correctly, you are the, the sort of acting CEO at the moment. Yes, yes, I am in fact the acting CEO of Angostura. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, fortunate and pleased to be able to serve the company in this way. Okay. All right, well, thank you all. And now let's jump into the video session or into the slides. So Ian, take it away. So ladies and gentlemen, Angostura is the world's market leader for bitters and one of the Caribbean's leading rum producers with a superb collection of premium rum brands rooted and developed in the spirit of Trinidad and Tobago. In 1824, our founder, Dr. Johann Gottlieb Benjamin Sigurd, perfected the formula for aromatic bitters. He perfected this formula to use it in his medical practice as Surgeon General to the armies of Simon Bolivar during the War for Independence. He called his, his product Amago Aromatico. In 1921, J.G.B. Seagert and Sons, producers of Angostura bitters, left the town of Angostura in Venezuela. That town is now known as Ciudad Bolivar. They officially founded their company in Trinidad and Tobago. The company remained a family-owned business until the late 1990s when the business was sold to a financial group. Today, Angostura is a stock-listed company here in Trinidad and Tobago with the government of Trinidad and Tobago being the majority shareholder. Angostura is considered, therefore, a jewel in the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. It is an almost 200-year-old company with an unprecedented story founded on a search for adventure. Angostura uses its traditional knowledge and makes bitters by infusing herbs and alcohol and then extracts the essences. Bitters was actually created as an elixir to soothe the, the, the ailments of the stomach, a traditional use which continues even today. In 2007, the bitters line was extended to incorporate Angostura orange bitters, which is made from its own recipe, as well as our lemon lime and bitters, a non-alcoholic carbonated simple serve beverage. Innovation continued here at Angostura with the launching of our latest product, Angostura Cocoa Bitters. This product was launched in August 2020, and it was made using Trinidad and Tobago's own Trinitario Cocoa, which is a unique and untapped resource. The latest addition also promotes the local agricultural industry. Current use of this product extends to enhancing flavors in various alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks, as well as in the culinary arts. Bitters in food is less well known globally, than bitters in alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverage applications, but this is in fact one of the applications for this product. Angostura made its, its first move into a new spirit category in 2014 with the introduction of Amaro de Angostura. Using Angostura aromatic bitters as a base, the Amaro is made with additional spices and neutral alcohol to create a 35% alcohol by volume herbal liqueur. Angostura is also one of the most awarded rum companies in the Caribbean, with 18 awards this year alone, and it continues to strive for excellence. That excellence is evident because we have produced a number of ultra premium, one of a kind blends. These one of a kind blends, uh, one of which is shown here, known as Angostura Infinity Rum, was produced to celebrate, celebrate the 195th anniversary of the company and was auctioned for charity. The proceeds from the auction will go to the Princess Elizabeth Home for Physically Handicapped Children in Trinidad, 
where it is being used for the refurbishment of a play park due to be completed in December 2020. Another example of one of our ultra premium, one of a kind blends is the Angostura Masters Blend. This particular blend we donated to the White Truffle Auction in Russia in 2019, where the proceeds are used for children's charities in that country. We shall do this again in 2020. These blends are a tribute to our all female blending team. And this in fact is a continuation of blending traditions rooted in Trinidad's rich, rich history derived from the United Kingdom and Portugal. In terms of our corporate social responsibilities as a company, during the current and unprecedented global pand pandemic, Angostura transformed its distilling capacity and capability to deliver all pharmaceutical demands for ethyl alcohol in the country, while also producing 50,375 milliliter bottles and 20,175 liter bottles of hand sanitizers. We donated this to uh, our first responders, to hospitals, to uh, persons in need all through the, the country in Trinidad and Tobago. We also donated to schools as well. Angostura's plant and facilities are in a socially depressed community where it has contributed towards employment and also helps schools and community endeavors. And this we have done for decades. In a further initiative to assist the community and to assist Trinidad and Tobago at large, 341 employees of our company donated a total of 1,074 vacation days to create a pool of funds valued at $1 million Trinidad and Tobago dollars that was used to purchase foodstuffs, toiletries, and essential items for families who were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. This picture shows you the kind of scale of food that had to be processed and delivered to communities and to individuals very much in need at that time as our country was going through a lockdown. In terms of responsible development, Angostura Limited has recently commissioned a new state-of-the-art waste water treatment plant. We aspire to be one of the most environmentally friendly rum companies in the Caribbean. This multi-million dollar project was completed with international collaboration from major European experts in the United Kingdom and in Germany with expertise in waste water treatment. The plant will ensure that our company operates within global environmental guidelines and practices. And we aspire to be a green company uh, with objectives, including using our biogas uh, as a source of energy. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that this gives you an overview of, of our distillery. We are proud of this distillery. We are proud of its heritage. We are proud of its age. And one of the things we can tell you is that we are a distillery with a difference. There's no other distillery that you can, can identify on the planet that produces bitters, that produces world-class rums, that produces sim simple serve carbonated beverages. We are a multifaceted uh, organization in this part of the world. Thank you very much. Over to you, Matt. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ian. Um, I just wanna add really quickly, uh, Angostura is the only uh, Trinidad distillery remaining today. So it, when you when you think about Trinidad rum, it is it is now Angostura rum. And uh, over the years, it, it for example, I know it, it had uh, acquired Fernandez back I don't know forty or fifty years ago. But Trinidad rum is now Angostura rum. Um, I love seeing those pictures of the uh, the, the very expensive one in a kind bottles. Uh, I was very very lucky to to try the legacy when I was down there in December. Uh, it, it, it was not in the original bottle that it was sold in, but it was it was a very lovely rum. So um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I have to thank Raymond Edwards for, for uh, making that happen for me. So, okay, let's jump into the videos. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, the fermentation video. Uh, this, this picture is very familiar to me. I think that's also in my blog post. Uh, this is, uh, we're going to talk about fermentation, and like I said, these videos are great. They show you much more than static pictures will. So, uh, hit it, Will. Angostura's fermentation process commences at yeast plant, where the yeast inoculum prepared by our on-site laboratory is first used to seed a pre-germinator vessel. Following the pre-germinated seedling, 
These mixes undergoes 12 to 18 hours of growth in the germinator, propagator, and the grain tank vessels, after which it is ready for fermentation. The unique fact of the fermentation process is that our yeast strain is native to Trinidad and through yeast conditioning and selective propagation, Angostura was able to create a specific strain which influences the flavor profile of our signature rums. Following our yeast plant operation, our, our distillery houses 10 fermentation vessels used for fermentation. The processes occurs in these closed fermentation tanks, each containing small vents for the release of gaseous byproducts, mainly carbon dioxide. Complete fermentation is achieved within 24 to 36 hours, reducing a fermented wash between 8 to 8.5 percent rum. As a sustainability objective and to reduce our carbon footprint, Angostura is currently seeking ways and means to utilize the carbon dioxide generated during the fermentation process. The blackstrap molasses used in our process is imported from countries around the globe based on specific parameters provided by Angostura and is stored in large tanks at our facility. To ensure quality assurance, samples are taken at our on-site distillery lab prior to procurement. In summary, our process involves yeast propagation which utilizes aerobic conditions followed by rum production through yeast fermentation requiring anaerobic conditions. Okay. And a question for you guys is, uh, is, is all fermentation the same or do you do different fermentation lengths for different, for different say, marks of rum? Wendell will, will respond. Hi, Matt. All fermentation is the same, right? Yeah. Okay. So, there, okay. So, there's just one standard fermentation you use there. For all the different rounds. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, yeah. And if, and it just when I was watching that, it occurred to me that um, it, there was a point in time not that long ago when, when Trinidad had enough of a sugar industry that where a, a substantial amount of the molasses that the Angostura used was was made in Trinidad. But now now you know, we have to import more from from elsewhere. So um, okay, uh, let's go to the next video: distillation and video presentation. This this is cool. I love this video. Uh, hit it well. The structure before you was built in 1947 and includes the GH1 and the GH2 rectification plants. The GH1 plant has since been decommissioned, however, it can still see remnants shown by blue and yellow colors, which connects us to our past. The GH2 stripper is the link between the fermentation, distillation, and spent wash treatment facility. It produces heavy rum between 80 to 84 percent by volume some of which is sent to the warehouse and aging facility to be placed in oak casts. There are two active rectification plants, the GH2 and the GH3 plant. The GH2 plant can produce 24,000 liters of rum per day and the GH3 plant can produce 60,000 liters of rum per day. It consists of four columns. Heavy rum passes through the cup reaction tank to remove impurities from the fermentation process called milk captains. Diluted rum leaves the hydrodetection column at 25% by volume and is fed to the rectifying column. The rectifying column concentrates rum to 95 to 95.8% by volume. Impurities from the rectifying column is fed to the recovery column where recovered alcohol is then fed to the hydrodetection column. The polishing column further cleans up the rum, which is then transferred to our bulk storage facility. So uh, a couple of things I, I will note off that video. Um, it they it was stated, but not you may have missed it. Is that essentially they're making two different rum. They're making a, a heavier rum, and some of which they age, 
and then they also make the lighter rum. So the heavy rum just goes through the, the, the stripping column, if you will, and then the but more of it goes through the through the GH3 uh, sort of multi-column uh, still for for higher rectification. So they are doing that sort of a heavy rum, a light rum, and then blending them together. Uh, a question for you, if I remember correctly, uh, this the GH1, GH2, and GH3 are are basically were instilled about several decades apart. I like the, there was the first one, GH1, and then. 10 or 20 years later to GH2 and then the GH3 is I think from the 1990s, if I remember correctly. Um, the question is, is the, the taller structure, that's the GH2 still, correct? No. No, the taller structure is the GH3 still. Okay, okay. Okay, yeah, because yeah, because I thought it said the GH1, GH3 were in the, the same structure and GH2 was in a different one. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes, Matt. Um, actually, in the in this the shorter of the two structures, GH one and GH two, are uh, in that in that oh, uh, structure. Okay. So sure. what happened is what GH one was replaced by GH two, and um, for a period of time, parts were discom were um, decommissioned, so that the, the 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 tower housed the first and second still. Okay. And now we've all transferred to the the second still only the GH two. The numbers give an idea of the generation. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Will, if can you is he able to pull up the video again, just quickly, just the beginning part. Yeah. The structure before you was built in 1947 and includes the GH one. So and GH1. Can you pause it, Will? Right, so you would see the blue and yellow painted columns. Those would have been the GH1 um, columns. And the structure that um, Kip spoke about that was built in 1947, the last upgrade to that structure would have been the GH3 stripping column that was installed in 1991. And then the tallest structure, the tall one that you're seeing, that would have been the last upgrade and that would have been installed in 1999. And those are the four rectification columns. Okay. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, and now and let's make sure we don't have any questions here that, that are specific to that. Uh, uh, I said, said somebody asked, uh, said those are, those are really large stills. They mostly look to be stainless steel. How much copper is used in, in them? And, and I assume all the plates are copper. No, Max, we don't have any copper, right? You only use copper is in the copper reaction tank, where the heavy rum goes through after it comes out the stripper. Okay. So, the, but are, I assume, are the, so there's, are any, every is stainless steel. Okay. So the, the plates themselves are not copper? No. Okay. Stainless steel. So it's all, it, all, all the copper is sort of at the last stage as it comes out? Yeah, at, at, the, at the last stage of heavy rum production, that's where you have the copper, the copper components. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, um, at what we have actually is, so the GH3 um, stripper, after the heavy rum is produced, the heavy rum goes into um, a copper reaction tank. Okay. Before it goes into the rectification column. So before okay. it goes for hydro selection, which okay. will dilute it down to between 20 to 25% um, strength, it passes through a copper reaction tank. Okay. Um, the GH2 had copper, um, copper plates, I believe, GH2, but we switched to a different um, technology and technique with the GH3 upgrade. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, and I could be wrong, but that sounds, that sounds like different from some of the other, other, still set up where they where they use, have the copper and the stills themselves so you have a, a separate copper reaction tank yes is, yeah. yeah okay interesting so yeah you see even i learned things on these on these videos so this is great uh, what, what, matt before you go along what i what i could tell you is that is that the gh3 system was german designed mm -hmm. uh so it was it was designed as as, as with a completely different perspective the mm -hmm. previous system what uh, the gh2 system to the best of my knowledge, was derived through um, a partnership that we had many years ago with Bacardi. So that's that still would have come through their procurement processes uh, for, for stills. That we're not quite sure who would have designed that, 
It right. could have been a, a Canadian company, possibly, based on what I've been told. But I definitely, the approaches are based on the fact that you had different um, designers, so to speak, behind the stills. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I do. I do remember Bacardi having uh, like a partnership or sort of partial ownership for a number of years, from I think the 1970s through the 1990s, if I remember correctly. Yes, that is correct. We were once uh, Bacardi was once uh, very much involved in this distillery. That's okay. correct. All right. Okay. So we've done fermentation. We've done distillation, uh, and now we're going to talk about waste management. And this is this is another cool video. So why don't you hit it, Will? The rum industry has stood the test of time throughout the years by innovation, adaptation, and creativity. The new frontier for rum is minimizing environmental impact and improved operational sustainability. Like fermentation, in harnessing the power of microorganisms for rum production, Angostura also uses a biological system for the treatment of distillery spent wash waste. First up, and currently on display on the screen, is the anaerobic treatment system where microbes break down the organically rich spent wash into biogas, a renewable and sustainable energy source. This biogas is captured within the state-of-the-art double membrane dome of the tank. Now we'll zoom across to the northern side of the Angostura facility as this is the next biological step in the treatment process, the aerobic treatment system. The aerobic treatment system continues the breakdown of the organic matter by combining air power and microbes to generate biomass or organic sludge which can be used either in fertilization or safely disposed at a solid waste facility. Angostura has partnered with the University of the West Indies for feasibility studies on the reuse of this biomass for agricultural purposes, continuing the innovation towards sustainable rum production. Yeah, so in that case, I was just saying, in that case, go ahead. Um, so yeah, so in that video, uh, one question I had that came to mind was, so the, you're saying that they, during anaerobic digestion, you're collecting the biogas. Is that in turn then used at the distillery for, for heating boilers or such? No, oh, that will be another phase of the um, project, where it is we would make use of the biogas either in a combined heat and power uh, plant or possibly a biogas um, boiler. Most likely, we'll be leaning towards a combined heat and power system. Okay, and uh, and just one other thing I wanted to point out to people, um, and if you want to watch it again in the replay, the the um, the big, the very large brick uh, building there, that's sort of like you see it, is sort of a center, a reference point in the videos. That is, that's one of the aging facility or one of the, one of the aging warehouses. Yes. Okay, and okay. So now, speaking of aging, uh, let's. Let's talk the aging video and presentation. We'll hit it. The clean rum that is drawn off from the still after distillation is stored in bourbon oak casks for aging. Angostura adheres to the strictest quality assurance, which seeks to ensure that every blend is produced to the highest standard. Prior to the age rum being selected for the use in blends, laboratory quality analysts who are training organoleptic appraisal techniques appraise the rum for off notes and suitability for use. Once the casts have been approved for a blend, casts are transferred to the emptying station where they are automatically emptied and transferred to the staging tanks or vats prior to send to the blending department.
after the emptying process has been completed, our on-site coupons sort and select cars that are in need of repairs. Our coupons assess each car to determine what repairs will be required. In some instances, we may replace individual stays or alter the metal bands. Each cast is initially hand-driven, followed by the use of one of our mechanical machines to further tighten the cast, which will ensure it is kept compact, minimizing what is referred to as the angel shape. Following repairs, each cast is pressure tested to ensure that there is no leakage. For this test, water is added to the cast and air is introduced at a maximum pressure of 5 psi. As an additional quality check, our coopers manually inspect each cast, ensuring that there are no leaks observed from the staves or at the head of the cast. To conclude the repairs, the cast requires sterilization prior to use. At Angostura, we use steam generated from low pressure boilers to sterilize our cast. Clean casts are transferred to an automatic filling station where rum is added for aging. At Angostura, we age light rum and some heavy rums to be used in our blends. After filling is completed, our train forklift operators transport and stack casts which are evenly distributed throughout our five warehouses based on age and product types. The inventory is maintained at approximately 70,000 cars with a total angel share being around 6% per year. Great. Um, a couple questions there. So are those, um, they, you mentioned 518 warehouses, are they all basically on the facility or are there others sort of spread out elsewhere? Um, are, so the are there when it mentioned that there were five aging warehouses? Are they all are they all sort of close together at the distillery, or are there others elsewhere on Trinidad? Uh, yes, based on throughout the compound. Okay. So they are all located on Angostura compound, but they are the front end points throughout the company. Okay, and it, it may have been the video I which my internet cut out in the middle of it. Um, so they're all ex bourbon cask, if I remember correctly. Bourbon, yes. Okay, and and there was something else I was going to say. Okay, um, drawing a blanket moment, but yeah. So um, oh, oh, last one I was going to add. Uh, so there was 
So you mentioned that there's there's the heavy rum, there's the light rum, and they're both aged. Is there also, do you also sort of create a, a medium blend of the two that's also aged? Yes, we do have a medium body rum that we put in cast also to age. Okay, great. Matt, if I may, uh, yeah. if I may, Matt, I just want to mention to you that, yes, that point you've made about the, the, um, the warehouses on one side, that is quite an important point. And we are currently in the process of bonding two additional warehouses off-site. And as a company, we intend to um, to procure uh, more warehouses off-site or in alternate locations. Mm -hmm. uh, this is all part of the of a strategy to grow our age stock as well as um, to sort of disaggregate the risk or right. the on-site risk. Mm -hmm. All of the warehouses um, are, are so packed as to have a predetermined um, range of ages. So in other words, in your warehouse, you have products not of one age, but of a range of ages. So if you lose a warehouse, you don't lose your entire stock of a particular period of time. So we recognize the risk and, um, and, and a, lot of, a lot has been done in terms of spend on infrastructure to um, pick up um, any, any risk in terms of fire and other emergencies. We also have on-site a dedicated fire water um, system, a firefighting system uh, to also protect our, our most important assets. Excellent. Great. Thank you for adding that. And okay, now back to this. So now I believe this is where Carol is going to jump in. Hi, everyone. Hi again. I will now take you through blending. Of course, not giving you all my blending secrets. <laughs> um, after aging, the rum is bulked, and this is then filtered, followed by uh, dilution because the rums would have been aged around 67%, 65 to 67%. So treated water is added to the age rum. And uh, then we would filter it before we actually send it to the bottling facility. So I will just walk you through some of our international rums and I'll start with the five year old blend. This is actually made up of light rums, light age rums, and the minimum age of these rums is five years. So in fact, we have some eight-year-old rums in here and some seven-year-old rums. But based on regulatory requirements, our five-year-old rum is five years because the youngest rum is five years. And just to take you quickly through the nose, it has a light woody note, top note, and this is surrounded by coconut, caramel, a hint of vanilla and lemon. When you taste it, you get some soft and delicate tropical fruit notes. And this is hint, there you get hints of mangoes and bananas. So we will then go to another rum profile. And this is our seven year old rum, which actually we changed the technique of aging in that we made the blend, the youngest rum being seven years. And this was recast for another two years. And this is really for all the flavors and the interaction with the wood and the alcohol bringing out more flavors to the blend. So when we nose it, you will get a bouquet of creamy aromas of chocolate, molasses, a hint of espresso, some dark fruits, and the taste, you get subtle nuances of chocolate, honey, toffee, caramel, even hints of roasted nuts, and this rum is a medium body rum. So we can go now to Angostura 1919. By the way, it's one of my favorites. I love Angostura 1919 with coconut water. 
the people who know me know that's my favorite mix. And the youngest rum in the 1919 is actually eight years old. And uh, here you get hints of woodiness as well as dried fruits and vanilla. When you taste it, it is well rounded. You get the oaky notes coming out and it has a medium body palate. And this is now surrounded by roasted hints of roasted nuts, spices and tropical fruits. So I will now take you to our Angostura 1824, which is an expression of our rich heritage. You would have heard Ian earlier speak to the Angostura aromatic bitters starting in 1824. So it was definitely made to celebrate the House of Angostura by Johann G. B. Sigurd as you know, started with bitters in 1824. The 1824 is actually a heavier bodied rum, and this is balanced with woody notes, a bouquet of bananas and dried fruits, and you get top notes of caramel and toasted vanilla. When you taste it, it is a well-rounded flavor of spices, burnt sugar, and oak on the palate, and subtle notes of dried fruits. And actually, you can pair 1824 with dark chocolate. And uh, for the men, you can pair it with a cigar. So we would move into 1787, which is our 15-year-old rum. And this is our super premium blend of rums, where the youngest rum in this blend is a 15-year-old rum. And this rum is, as I said, it would be more medium to heavy bodied, um, a sweet bouquet of banana, dried fruit, oaky notes, with hints of apples. When you taste it, it is well balanced and it has a medium body palate with hints of prunes and sweet rounded oak notes. And then last but not least, our Amaro di Angostura, which Ian would have mentioned earlier. And this really is one of our blends, which is really a digestive and it has our Angostura aromatic bitters combined with our alcohol, with spices. So when you taste it, you get hints of cinnamon, toasted caramel flavors, and with a pleasant bitter and licorice notes. So that's some of our products that I am presenting today to you. Ian would have mentioned we had some international awards, and these were specifically from the San, San Francisco Spirits Award, the World Spirits Award, SIP Awards, and Drinks International. Thank you. Um, uh, during your description of the 1787, I had to reach behind me and grab some and, uh, and taste it again. <laughs> I do very, I do very much enjoy the 1787. I don't think you mentioned where that name comes from. The 1787. Yeah. That was a tradition of, um, I believe, the sugarcane factories and the start of the the sugar in in um, Trinidad, the sugar industry in Trinidad. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, that's yeah, that's my recollection as well. It's like the first sugar commercial sugar factory in Trinidad or something along those lines. So uh, here, here in America, it's it's we know it as like the the Constitution. But uh, so it's it, it, it's interesting to see that that number on a bottle. But um, so yeah, this is a, this was a great great overview of the of the Angostura product line. Um, and is there any more of the slide presentation? Will? Oh yes. Now, uh, that's right, I, I recognize this. Um, now we're going to talk about Angostura bitters. And, and, this, and this is particularly exciting. I got to, to see 
the this room while I was in Trinidad, but I did not actually get to see see things actually bubbling and moving around and grinding and stuff. So uh, go ahead and play the video, Will. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to our bitters manufacture process plant. And we are going to make some bitters today. Um, first of all, all our dried botanicals have to be approved by our quality control lab and our food safety team before these are used and ground. The ground botanicals are weighed by the bitters manufacturer and they hold the secret formulation. The secret room is actually above this process room and the ground botanicals are transferred into these baskets. But before that, they are mixed in our mixer, which is actually over 50 years old. I think the video is going too fast. Um, the, uh, ground botanicals basket are placed on top of the percolator some of these percolators are actually over 40 years old so we then extract with alcohol and here is where the magic happens where all the aromatic flavors and all the colors natural colors come through essential oils this is then transferred to our concentrate tank where we mix sugar and our very own caramel based on our own caramel plant. The concentrate is aged for three months for more of the aromatic flavors and essential oils to marry. Then that is diluted to 44.7%. And this is then filtered and we send it to the bottling hall, but it must be approved by the laboratory before the transfer. This is our bottling line. You will see this is where old technology meet new technology. So after our bottles are stacked, they are then filled and capped. So here we'll be seeing the bottles lined up to be filled by our filler block unit, which was made specifically for our bitters by a company in Italy. And this is capped, followed by the label, the labeler, which is a Marco labeler. So it's capped. And then it's labeled using our standard nap, um, then sealed. using our standard nap case sealer. And presently bitters is in over 170 countries. You would have seen our latest innovation with our Angostura cocoa bitters, which is available in the UK, in Spain, Russia, and Baltics, and will be available in Taiwan later this year, and Australia and South Africa in 2021. Our Bitters won two awards this year as the world's best-selling bitters and top trending bitters. <clears throat> That's it for us. Well, thank you. Uh, so I have one very pressing question. Um, uh -huh. So I know that there are, there are four ounce bitter bottles and there are 16 ounce bitter bottles. Yes. Uh, and I know there are five gallon pails and I know there are 55 gallon drums of Angostura bitters. 
How many of those do you sell a year? Well, in terms of the bitters produced, cases produced, it's around 300,000 cases. These are standard cases per year. And in terms of the drums, the 55-gallon drums, which we sell as bulk, it would be around 100 of those per year. Okay. And um, that would be our bulk bitters. Okay. Which we sell to our distributors. So we could so okay, so that's fascinating. A hundred and fifty-five gallon drums of bitters are sold every year. <clears throat> um, can you share a little bit more? I, my recollection is that there's there's like a special tax or not a, a regulatory um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Special regulatory exemption that for example, the spices or the bitter components that come in sort of go through Trinidad Customs without necessarily being inspected uh, and are maybe in like special colored bags or something. Can you share us more about sort of the secret parts of it? Well, if I tell you, I'll be giving you some of the secrets of the okay. Okay. botanicals. But um, certainly the botanicals are numbered when they come into the country. And um, we actually have permission from our food and drugs to have those numbers, but the botanicals are inspected as following our customs regulations and our plant quarantine regulations. Okay. Um, all right, so I think that's the end of the present, the formal slide presentation. Anything else, Will, on that? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Then uh, let's jump into the questions here. Um, the first question is uh, from uh, Brian Joseph. Does Angostura have any plans to contract any local farmers to start growing sugarcane so that Angostura could be 100% local product instead of importing molasses? <clears throat> You're, 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 you're a little muffled there. Hi, Matt. Just give yeah. us a second. I'm going to adjust the audio so that we can take questions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, did you did you hear the question? Yes, we did. Yes, okay. we did, Matt. Okay. Yeah, Matt. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Can you just? Matt. Can you, yeah. I, I can respond. I can respond on behalf of the team. At the, okay. at, the present, at the present time, we do not. We do not have. At the present time, we do not have any plans. The quantum that would be needed, given the size of our distillery, uh, we could not right now get that the, the, the kind of volumes of molasses that we would need for that to be totally indigenous. It's not beyond the realm of imagination that we could consider getting some of it in the future. And we have contemplated it ourselves, um, even to the point of considering um, the, the, the benefits or pitfalls of having our own plantation. Um, we have dealt with it conceptually, um, but at this point in time, uh, we have not gone forward with it in, in, a, in a serious way. So at the, at the present time, it will be a commodity that we source. Um, and if we were to go this way, it would be something totally within our scope of control. In other words, we would have to own and control the factory to produce the molasses, sugar being the, the byproduct in that case. So it's, it's conceivable, but there, there are no immediate plans. Right, right. And, for, and, and I think the, what people may not realize is that it's not just growing the sugar cane, uh, it's, it's actually processing it and, and having all the equipment and basically the factory to process it. And if I remember correctly, the last Trinidad Sugar Factory closed not that long ago or shut down not that long ago. So even if you had all the cane, you wouldn't necessarily have the, the infrastructure to process it. Yeah, that, that's right. The last sugar factory closed, I think it's around 1995, in the late 1990s. Uh, possibly in late 1995, and um, what we have is really um, uh, very, very um, remnants of these factories. So the question would be: Could we rehabilitate a factory if we give them one, or would we then have to start 
uh, our very own system uh, on, our, on, on our own property and, um, and then contract farmers. So the jury's out on that. Um, it's a possibility. I wouldn't I would say that it's, it's, it's um, something that we won't consider. But we are not close to plans in this regard. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. How old is the oldest barrel at Angostura? Like, what's, what's your oldest barrel of, of aging stock that you happen to have? Chris? Uh, we should have a 23-year-old medium heavy barrel. Okay. Yeah, ask in one of our warehouses at the moment. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, the fermentation tank appears to be closed topped, and I, th I think it was said in the video. Um, do you do anything with the captured CO2? And that's by Dave Russell uh, from San Francisco. Yeah. All right, Matt, not at present, right? But in the future, we are looking to capture the CO2 and maybe look to use it in the beverage industry. That's one of our sustainability projects come 2021, 2022. Okay. Yeah, I think I, 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 yeah, I, think I, I have to say a bit okay. more about the sustainability as well. So um, it's it's something it's something that um, I, I am personally involved in. Um, I have been uh, pushing the team in that direction. So carbon dioxide recovery is one of the things that we want to to uh, address. The um, productive use of biogas is another. Uh, water recovery would be a third. Effectively, when we finished with the treatment of our waste, we essentially want to have water that we could possibly reuse in some aspect of the process. Now, this will take some time. Um, I can tell you that at one point in time, many years ago when I was in the brewing industry, Angostura did in fact have a CO2 recovery plant many, many years ago. And so they did have a plant. Um, that plant has, has in time became defunct and we would have to invest in a new plant. So suffice it to say that we've been there before and we're going back again in terms of CO2 recovery. Biogas is completely new. It's very exciting. We're having a lot of interest in terms of biogas, productive use of biogas, even in terms of um, uh, green automotive technology because compressed natural gas is something that we, we uh, use to power some of our, our fleet. Um, as a company, as well as in Trinidad and Tobago, it is something that the government is encouraging. So biogas is promising, and water reuse and recovery is also critical and, and, uh, and helpful uh, to uh, water conservation. These are the three directions that as a company we intend to uh, progress. Okay. Um, good answer. Next question. Uh, and this is actually something I had wondered about uh, when I was down there and when I learned more about uh, Angostura's rum making and I uh, chatted a bit with John Georges about it at the time. It's, it's why did Trinidad go the route of the Spanish heritage producers rather than, you know, the, a classic British style rum? Trinidad being, of course, a, a former British colony. Uh, and they say, go on to say, for example, St. Lucia puts out excellent products using its pot stills, including the one that came from Angostura a number of years back. Um, so that, that's part one. And then part two would, you know, is, is adding a pot still into your, your distillation mix a possibility? Hi, Matt. Um, with regards to the rums we produce, um, remember you would have seen the distillation so our rums are produced from aged column still rums. Mm -hmm. And currently we don't have a pot still. So the style would be more um, what's coming out of our fermentation. You Well, it wasn't mentioned before, but we have a signature yeast, um, which we keep at an East Bank in England. And um, the style of rum would really start there in fermentation from that particular yeast. Um, so our rums are not pot still rums. They would just be column still age rums. Yep, Matt, let me, let me say something about that. Um, if you really want to get into the heritage uh, aspect of that question, it has, it has to do with how the Caribbean developed historically. Sugarcane production started really in the Northern Caribbean 
and it eventually came to the Southern Caribbean, Caribbean a little bit later. So places like, um, like Jamaica and Haiti and other parts of the French and English speaking Caribbean were further along in terms of, of sugarcane production. And at that point in time, uh, were far more great, uh, their influence was far more greater in terms of the, the influence of the British. So the British were in Jamaica and in Barbados for a considerably longer time than they were in Trinidad. Trinidad was a Spanish colony, a Spanish colony that changed hands in the early 1800s or so and became a British colony. So that, and, and even though it was a Spanish colony, it actually had a lot of French influence because of revolutions that were taking place in the Northern Caribbean. Many French aristocratic planters came to Trinidad and Tobago and were granted large tracts of land by the government of the day, the Spanish government of the day. So our heritage is not really British. It is in fact Spanish and French. Out of that then, when we went into sugarcane production, you found that at that point in time, the, the British did have some influence, uh, but a lot of the, product of, of the sugarcane heritage um, and, and, um, and rum production heritage came kind of out of some British, but as well as some Portuguese entrepreneurs. Specifically, what is very silent in Angostura's history is the fact that we, the last distillery that we merged with was the Fernandez distillery. The Fernandez is a Portuguese family that came to Trinidad many decades and centuries ago. And they were merchants that went into the, the alcohol business and eventually owned their own plantations and their own distillery. They put their own spin on rum production. And their rum production um, uh, a tradition is largely what Angostura followed and eventually inherited. And finally, in Trinidad and Tobago, there were a number of sugarcane estates, small sugarcane estates and small sugarcane plantations that made rum using various um, bits and pieces of technology. But in the end, because of the size of the island and the population of the island, the larger, the larger companies are the ones that persisted. And in the end, there were three. There was Angostura, there was Fernandez, and there was Carney. Carney was derived from the Tate and Lyle Company, which was a British company. And Carney 1975 Limited was formed by the government after Tate and Lyle divested. So in essence, there were three large producers and those were consolidated into one. So Angostura's heritage is that of Carney, Angostura's heritage is that of the Fernandez, and Angostura's heritage is its own experimentation in terms of rum, uh, rum and spirits production, first for bitters and then later on for its own brand. Yeah. Thank you. But that, that is a, that's a fantastically detailed answer. Um, and I think you, know, you highlight a great point is that w what we see today when we think of the history of an island or, or a country, uh, we tend to see you know, sort of the la when it last changes, but the Caribbean was rapidly changing from, from 1650 uh, till current day. Uh, that territories would would your colonies would go back and forth between between you know European you know overseers uh, that, that there was a lot of history and a lot of different evolution and so it's so you know it's one reason when we think about like the Spanish or the the colonial uh, rum styles they're really not uh, a great way of describing rums in, in a lot of in a lot of circumstances because there's a lot more nuance to it than then the Spanish did things this way and the French did things one way. So a uh, great historical answer there. Um, thank you for that. You for that. Okay, um, next question is, so, oh yes, Stanley Tempro asked, what happens to the biogas currently uh, from the waste treatment? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll, take that. I'll take that question. Current, currently the biogas is played off. Um, so they so when they when the plant was commissioned, that was intended to be a the, the, the reuse of biogas was intended to be a second phase in the expansion of the plant. Um, what so what we're currently doing is flaring off the gas, but we are immediately working on a phase two and have proposed to our board of directors that we consider its productive use uh, in generation of electricity. 
Our feasibility study has already shown that the volume of biogas that can be generated by our plant, by our waste plant, is sufficient to probably power the entire site. In addition to biogas for electricity generation, we are also having some indications and expressions of interest from our national gas company in terms of also possibly partnering with, with us to collect and process that biogas and to reuse that biogas as a, a green energy for motor vehicle, uh, as a motor vehicle fuel. So there's a lot of interest right now in Trinidad and Tobago. So we are the cusp of really um, going to, to that next step. Our board of directors are excited about the prospect of a productive use of biogas. And as a country, Trinidad and Tobago is very, very much interested in terms of um, alternative energy. Yeah, and Matt, the reason why it's a bit, we put it onto phase two is um, because the system is a biological system, um, we need to see what efficiencies and production capacities from the biogas we'll get out of it. Um, we just have one anaerobic digester, so we're doing the feasibility part first, and so that's why we're simply flaring at this time, while it is we gather the data to see which direction would be the best direction to go in for the biogas reuse. Okay. Um, next question. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, it says all just from Dave Russell. It says all aged Angostura rums have a distinct, very pronounced aroma and flavor of vanilla. Besides the vanilla extracted from the oak barrels aging, is there anything else that ex helps explain that flavor? Hi. Um, well, with our rums, we it is from aging, as and I had mentioned earlier, through our um, yeast fermentation, we get different flavors coming from that with the particular yeast we use. So we don't add any additives to our rums, as I mentioned when I started describing blending, that we take the aged rums and we dilute it to the strength using treated water and filter it before it goes to bottling. And so it's the aged rum from 65 to 67% alcohol, diluted with treated water, and then it's filtered. In the case of the darker rums, we use caramel, which we produce at our own caramel plant. So that's what you will have in our rums. Okay. Uh, next question from John Atkins says, what is the oldest rum in the blend for the 1787? The oldest rum in the in the fifteen year old. That's the question. Yeah. yeah so yeah. we will have a twenty year old rum in that blend of the fifteen year old, the medium to heavy body rum. Okay. Um, next question from Vaughn says, "What is what is your experience with angel share losses in the aging warehouse?" Are there differences depending on position? For example, the top of the warehouse as compared to the bottom. Um, and then I'll, I'll let you answer that and then I'll go on there. Um, no, I don't know the difference at the moment. No, we didn't notice much of a difference compared to the different warehouses stationed here. Okay. And are there, okay, no, no, okay. And then Vaughn also asked, I thought I saw non-US barrels in one of the videos. Do you use barrels from other sources besides just ex-bourbon? We use experimental barrels um, like sherry cask and so. Um, I don't know if you recall, we did a limited edition um, some years ago, the cask collection, where we the first number one was in bourbon cask, the second number one was in a cognac cask and the last one which was in a sherry cask. So we do have sherry cask and experimental cask in and around the aging warehouse. Okay. Um, next question and, and one, one I anticipated, uh, they would like to know how much Caroni rum you have left in stock. <laughs> 
so so Matt, um, that that's a story. That's that one is a story. So um, just like Columbus came to the to come to this came to this part of the world as a voyage of discovery. We were going through our eight stops, and we found tucked into a, a a very um, obscure corner of the warehouse. We did find some carony rocks, and uh, and and we do have that, and we are very pleased to have it, and and we will do something special with that rum, which you which you will hear about in the very near future. So we have very little of it, and what we have is really as precious as gold. Uh, so that's that's the story of our Carney Rum. Okay. Um, another question. This one from Sheldon Hostin says, "Any chance of releasing higher strength rum and longer aged Angostura Fernandez expressions?" Uh, definitely, definitely. First of all, the easy one, higher strength rums. That is something that we are looking into. Um, we are we have started we've started um, we have started experimenting with that and in fact we will start to bring out expressions with higher levels of alcohol um, it the, the desire or the impetus to do that depends on the jurisdiction so for instance excise taxes are a bit high in Trinidad so that you know there, there, there's there's a um, limited scope for that in Trinidad but we do know that in Europe, um, cask, cask strength rums as an innovation, as a, as, a, as a unique expression, that is quite popular. And we may in the future consider a cask strength rum, particularly for that market. We recognize that the European market uh, does in fact have a few niche enthusiasts who are very interested in cask strength rums. So we've started looking into it. Um, and, and um, I would say the U.S. does too. Send, send some the U.S. as well. The U.S. Okay. Well, we're pleased to hear that, and we and we're happy and we're happy to hear that, and we will bear that in mind. On the Fernandez expression, I would say to you, Matt, that that is something of personal interest to me. I find personally that the Fernandez side of the business is not as um, that the, the legacy and provenance of the Portuguese rum makers and their legacy and impact on rum production, at least in this part of the world, and, I, and by extension, not only in Trinidad, but Guyana, that is actually a unique thing. And I feel it is that something is something that we should uh, consider more. We are very pleased about the diverse history of, of our company. So we have a German guy who goes to fight a war in, 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 in Venezuela, a war for independence against the Spanish, who then creates um, a herbal product that then eventually becomes so popular that he has to start his own distillery to continue making his herbal product. We've happened upon a series of influences to create a unique company. So we, uh, we know about flavor, we know about rum production, we know even about soft drink production. So it's, it's something special. But the Fernandez side of the company, there's a lot that we can do there. And right now, the Fernandez family, still some, some members of that family still live in Trinidad and are still uh, partners with us. And doing something under the Fernandez expression is something that I intend to raise and promote with my colleagues. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think I met one of them when I was down there. You, you, you met Mr. Joseph Fernandez. Yeah. That's correct. Okay, next question. Uh, what fuel is used to power the steam boilers at Angostura? Um, Matt, we power the steam boilers natural gas, right? We have two natural gas steam boilers capable of producing 15,000 kilograms per hour. And, and Matt, you, you would understand that natural gas is something that is, um, is, is a product of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we are, one of the things about being this far south in the Caribbean is the fact that we are very close to Venezuela and we are in a zone where you have a lot of hydrocarbon deposits. So Trinidad as a country has been in, oil, in, in the oil industry for over 100 years and in the last 30 or 40 years it has developed uh, natural gas as a viable product. So natural gas is what we use to power our industry. Okay. 
the next question, one is one near and dear to my heart. Uh, I know that uh, some of the, the tiki cocktail enthusiasts are curious about this. Is, will Angostura ever put a version of Charypton back on the market? Yes, Matt, that is in the works in maybe a few years' time. We will be looking to do something along those lines. Yeah. Charypton. Yeah. That's how we know the name in Trinidad. Yeah, Charypton. Yes, okay. Yeah, it was interesting. I, I was uh, doing some research and I found it was, it was a uh, it seemed to be a product much earlier than I thought it was. I think in as early as the 1870s or so. Okay, let's see what. Yeah, yeah. We um, Harry was saying that we started some work some years ago, so it's it's on our list of things to do. Yes. Yes, I think the the, the TE people would be happy for that. Um, <clears throat> next question. What is what is Angostura's export strategy with regard to Europe? Are there any particular market segments or or countries that are being uh, getting primary focus? Yeah, Matt, I'll take that question. So, um, within the last five years, let me, let's give, let me give you a little bit of a background. When we first started an export, uh, maybe about fifteen years ago, we actually started in France. France was where we learned about the European market. But within the last five years, we have been we have focused on a number of European markets and we've been moving through Western Europe into Central and Eastern Europe. So our footprint, our, our, our partners go as far as Azerbaijan, Ukraine, and Russia. You did notice that I told you that we did do an ultra premium blend for um, a, comp a company known as Simple, uh, Simple. Uh, they are Russian distribution, uh, spirits distribution company. And we did that for a special uh, auction that they host every year called the White Truffle Auction. So in principle, our intention is to be ever present in Europe and our, our channel and positioning in Europe is primarily through the on-premise channels so we are very much present in, in high-end uh, cocktail bars, and we are also positioning ourselves as a premium rum in this market. So, so we cover Western, Central, and Eastern Europe. Okay. Uh, same, same, actually, for me, the same question for the U.S. Like, for example, I know that the 1787 was not available in the U.S. for a very long time. Can you comment? I, I don't actually don't know if it is now. Can you comment on, on sort of the U.S. positioning? That was uh, it's, it's 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 something that uh, it's something that we have to look into. We have we have the opportunity to uh, to relook at our strategy. At the time, um, I think it was a question of finding the right positioning. It tends to be a bit more expensive, uh, a bit more premium in pricing. So it's a question of finding the right um, positioning and strategy to get it into the market. Uh, so we, we have the intention to to, uh, to to have it more prevalent, um, uh, but we still have some work to do there. Okay. Um, switching topics. Vaughn asked, Angostura has proprietary yeast isolated from your local strains. Are there any other plan? Are there any plans to develop other local strains going forward? Um, no, not not at this time. Um, uh, as you would have, uh, Carl would have mentioned, the strain of yeast um, also contributes to our flavor profile. And so, as a, a particular, um, well, I call it rosiness, tasting rum profile. So at this time, no, we don't have any any. Um, need or direction to go in a, a new yeast strain um, process. Okay. Uh, next question. Are there any plans to improve the packaging? Um, and I'm, I'm just reading what they say here. They say better bottling, abandoning the plastic regulators and screw caps, and pricing to compete with rums from elsewhere. Uh, it says Angostura rums are consistently higher priced than competitor rums from elsewhere, even here in Trinidad. Uh, that aren't as interesting from those as the pot still. So, 
I, I, there's a there's a whole bunch in that question, but I think you know the key things are in at least in Trinidad, any plans to improve packaging and things like that. Yeah, Matt, in, in this business, you have to look at what you're doing all the time. Um, so certainly that is something that we are looking at very, very actively. And we hope to, um, we hope to have um, something of interest to introduce to the market by way of packaging very soon. So uh, absolutely, we have to con continuously review and examine what we're doing given the competitive set that we are up against. So certainly that's on the list of things to be done by the company. Okay, okay. well, thank you. I see we're running a little over on time here, uh, but uh, we've covered an amazing amount of material here and you've answered a lot of questions. So uh, anything, anybody there on your end would like to say before we sign off here? Yes, Matt, it's, it's been our pleasure to participate in this, uh, in this uh, live streaming um, technical session. Um, on behalf of the team here, it was our pleasure to, work, to put this together. Um, it's a brave new world in terms, of, uh, in terms of what we can do with technology. But most interestingly and most importantly, it was our pleasure, pleasure to connect with persons from so many parts of the world who are so interested in rum. It's very exciting to us, and we are, um, are very interested to continue to participate and to contribute to the discussion about rum. Thank you so much to you and your team. Thank you. Thank you. I, I know uh, all, all the emails and WhatsApp messages going back and forth. I know how much effort uh, you all put into making this presentation. So we're, we're very appreciative of that. It's our pleasure. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm going to. Just before Will signs us off here, they, uh, we have another session in two weeks from now, and we'll be heading to the island of Barbados. So uh, you don't want to miss this one. Will, take us away. Wow, now I'm, I'm on pins and needles over here because uh, I don't even know who's next. So uh, that's very exciting. You narrowed it down a little bit for us. Uh, but yes, thank you so much. Uh, it was great like just just seeing so many people from the Angostura team all in one room, all bringing their different perspectives, different types of expertise to the table. Really fascinating presentation. I've just been sitting here like just listening and <laughs> learning myself. Uh, best best uh, or award for best drone footage as well goes to uh, to this presentation. Uh, so well yeah, done, really quick, Angostura sorry. team. Let's say really quick, there is on the Angostura side, at least the last time I looked, there's like, full 15 minute segment like drone fit like a full 15 minute segment that's definitely worth checking out as well so yeah and uh if you're uh viewing right now if you look underneath the video uh i switched the link over now so it takes you to angostura's website so you should be able to click that you can learn uh about a lot of stuff there but yeah i think that video is there as well so um yes thank you again to everyone uh for attending and we will be back in two weeks to visit someone uh from the island of barbados apparently so i look forward to that but uh thanks again everyone and uh, we'll see you again soon take care Bye. Okay, bye for now.